get away from the seven day micro cycle. There is no, it's not written in stone that you have to organize all your training around a seven day cycle. And a seven day cycle is extremely problematic. It's just a pain in the butt to deal with. This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. Dr. Stephen Siler, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. The very first question that we always like to ask our guest is, what training session did you do today? Or as is your case, it's the morning. Or what do you have planned for today? Yeah, uh, today I have planned. It's the morning for me, so I don't usually train until the evening. Uh, I'll be on Zwift up in my loft. I have my own bike and that, and I'll probably just be doing a two, two and a half hour fairly steady state ride today. Uh, and then tomorrow's hard. Are you in training for any particular event? Really? You know, I'm really not. I, I am. <laughs> I just, uh, I use the training both for my psychology and my physiology. I do some races on Zwift, uh, but it's mostly just, uh, uh, I enjoy the process and I, I'm, I'm a geek. So I end up using Zwift as a, a laboratory, you know, so I test out test out different ideas, <laughs> workouts, equipment, you know, different technologies. So uh, I guess I need I need to get a life, to be honest. <laughs> now, we would be remiss if we didn't ask the what basically what a lot of people see is the father of intensity distribution in the uh, in the triathlon and cycling uh, industry. What does easy actually mean to you? So two, two to two and a half hours on the bike, what intensity is that specifically? Well, in watts for me right now at 57, it's it's going to be – it's been 200 generally, somewhere around 200 watts. But I, I'm trying even to go a little lower than that these days, maybe 180 for an average, 185 for a two-and-a-half-hour ride. But then there will be other endurance rides. It'll be 225 average for two-and-a-half hours. Uh, and, and that's kind of pretty close to my – first lactate turn point. So I'm in that range, 185 to 225 during those long rides. So, yeah, so I, uh, my steady state endurance rides, I typically try to keep a fairly constant power and then I let heart rate slide a little bit and then I try to manage that. In other words, I will, um, you know, I'll shut it down when I feel like the, the heart rate drift has become uh, enough, you might say, consistent with the goals of that workout. You know, other people do it a different way. Other people will keep constant heart rate and let heart, let power yeah, go down. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it's interesting that you said you're close to that LT one because um, that was my next golden question: is how close are you willing to kind of get yourself? I mean, I don't know if you've tested recently in the lab. You know exactly what your LT one is, but um, it would 200 watts be? Um, 20 watts below or 30 watts or 40 watts? Because I think it, it does make a difference. A good question. Yeah, generally, I when I've done the lactate testing, when I, you know, the LT1 for me, both using ventilatory measures and lactate has been in that 220 to 230 range, you know, uh, so 200 watts has been fairly comfortably below that. Um, and then again, sometimes I will let the, let the, power go up closer to LT1, you know, just trying to see how I'm handling that. And, and, uh, so for sure I'm, I'm doing, I'm not doing powers that I can't do at least two and a half, three hours, you know, uh, without kind of being in a go empty, uh, in those workouts, but that's just me. And I, you know, others were probably laughing and going 225 Watts, man, that's just, I'd fall off the bike. at such a low power output, but we're all different, you know? And and in in the the winter the dead of winter in um, in Norway at the moment um, it is probably difficult to get outdoors and do some endurance riding outside. So you're really having to do a lot of your endurance riding indoors. And and is that the reason why you're happy to do 
two, two and a half hours um, on the trainer. Um, and are you able to get outdoors at all? Well, I, I could, it's been pretty an icy and snowy recently. I don't do, I, I have before, but I don't do a lot of outdoor training right now. I, I have become an indoor training geek. And again, it's partly, or it's a lot because of just the fact that being a physiologist, it has been so enjoyable for me to be able to use my my training just to, to test out some things to test like i say the technologies you know i i have told people before in my upstairs cycling room i have done muscle emg i've done muscle oxygenation i've done core temperature measurements i've done skin temperature with a FLIR radar <laughs> i've done lactate i've done ventilation you know so i i'm pretty geeky um, but mostly it's just because I'm using it to time to help me think about projects, think about ways of teaching things, you know, and test again, testing technology. So that's kind of become my arena there. And so I'm not getting outdoors to train for specific events, but I do some events on Zwift. So I've become a, an esports athlete, which is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard you recently made the jump from B grade to A grade, which is always exciting on Zwift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I found out it was just sucky because it just all I did was all I did was get beat on by the better the because I was on the lower end of the A yeah. spectrum, you know, and so yeah. I was just getting ground up like hamburger, you know. And so <laughs> I, I went back to B. <laughs> yeah, have some have some more fun. So yeah, we we have to start this conversation and and really look at the definition of uh, this now infamous word I think in the industry, and that's polarized training. And you are the pioneer of of polarized training. And it, I know that the definition will get lost in translation. Uh, and I, we want to know from the source and from you. Um, what do you what are you talking about specifically with eighty twenty? Because that's what kind of polarized training means for. Um, Right. How most of us see it with eighty twenty. Uh, we we really want to get clarity on. Um, are you talking about the whole week in its entirety? Are you talking about uh, per session, so the intensity per session, per hard session? Uh, is it a mix of both? Can you can you really clarify that for us? Yeah. Well, so the original research that we did, the methodology was based on sessions. So we were we were essentially putting the sessions in boxes in categories based on the lactate concentration, the heart rate, the, you know, all the physiology plus the perceptual data says, was this, was this an, a low intensity session, a threshold session or a high intensity session? So and we call that methodology session goal. What was the goal of the session? Was it executed to that task? And then you, we categorize and that's where this distribution came from in a three, you know, three category uh, system. Now, if you if you use your heart rate monitor and you use time in zone where you've set up thresholds for your LT1, your LT2, uh, then you would also you could get three zones from your heart rate monitor or 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 anchor them with the same, but then have five. That's pretty typical. And you'll get time in zone based on heart rate. And, and that'll be different. It'll give you a different distribution. And, and for example, we compared these in athletes, high performance uh, cross country skiers, and 80 20 would end up being like 90 10 based on heart rate. Okay. So, but that's again, these are athletes doing 25 hours of training a week and a lot of extensive work. And so then when those athletes, they'll get, a, the, you know, even a 90% distribution uh, towards the, low intensity side but the 10 percent still represents two hours of high intensity work mm, 20 right you know mm. so so the, that's the tricky thing so anyway so that's the session goal was the methodology that that's where 80 20 came from 75 25 80 20 um and if i if i fast forward 20 years on and say what is what what are we polarizing is it the signal to the muscle is it the stress on the heart versus on the peripheral system 
Is it what is it? I would say my best guess is that we're polarizing the stress. We're polarizing particularly autonomic nervous system stress. That that just means total stress on the body. How the body the body's not individualizing it. It's just it's just what the body perceives as total work. That systemic fight or flight response. Okay, so we're we're generally trying to generate signals for muscle adaptation for various for heart adaptation at the very cellular level. So the so very micro level. But as we are generating that signal, we're stressing the whole body because the whole body is a you know it's a multi system uh, or organ, and and in doing so, athletes are activating that so-called fight or flight response, this sympathetic mobilization, you know, where uh, it's, it's in our DNA, it's in our uh, organism, organism as a, as a survival function. So when, when we're taking off on an interval session, heart rates going up, you know, we're, we do a, a lot of activation processes that help our body to, to meet the, the danger. Because that's essentially what the body is saying. Oh, you know, I'm running from the bear. So I, what do I need to do here? Well, I need to sweat. I need to move blood flow to working muscle. I'm going to turn off my kidneys for right now. I'm going to turn off my liver for right now because I don't need that. That's not critical right now. I'm going to make sure I still get blood to my brain. So the body does a whole lot of things to allow for this, this mobilization. But it's costly. And and if it's done, if if we're mobilizing that system every day, then what ends up happening is we get a kind of a uh, a breakdown. The sympathetic nervous system, the the brakes will go on on in athletes, and then we see it first as an overreaching, and then the, in in the worst case scenario, we see athletes becoming what we call overtrained. This overtraining syndrome, and it can take months or even longer to come back from that kind of a uh, a system failure you might say um, but for for most age groupers if you're training you know 10 hours a week what you end up doing you may not get a, a pure overtraining center but you just stagnate uh, you stagnate and you are chronically fatigued because you're doing a bit too much of that higher stress component and it, it shows up in different ways. Uh, I, ha- I, had a, I had an athlete send me a message one time. He says, I've switched to this polarized train, and it's amazing. My maximum heart rate has gone up 10 beats. And I, and I wrote, I said, well, I don't think necessarily your true maximum heart rate went up, but you sounds like you've been chronically overreached for 10 years. <laughs> you know, you've had the brakes on, but now you've let the brakes off. You've, you've gotten your your rest and recovery right and now your heart rate is where it should be as a maximum heart rate you know and so we see a lot of that is when athletes get the distribution right which is basically means getting the the high stress sessions and the recovery balanced out then they function better they're more there's more continuity and there's and it's sustainable for them it's a real dilemma, isn't it? And you you nailed it by mentioning the athlete who has eight hours available, or ten hours, or six hours, and and they're in this dilemma that you know how am I going to get that aerobic base built with such limited time, and I want to improve. And every athlete's the same. I want to improve quickly, and yet I. I know I need to do some endurance. I know I need to do some intensity. And the only time I've got available is intensity. So we end up just doing intensity day after day. And then then we're not getting that recovery for us to train hard enough at the end of the day. And what do you say to those people who are in that situation? What is your advice around that short amount of time um, trying to get the best bang for your buck, I suppose. So here's the first thing I'm going to say, and I think this is particularly true for triathletes. That is, get away from the seven-day microcycle. There is no, it's not written in stone 
that you have to organize all your training around a seven day cycle. And a seven day cycle is extremely problematic. It's just a pain in the butt to deal with. It's a number of days, nothing works out. There's always something every week. But what happens if you, if you take that and go to 14 days? So now, now the triathlon microcycle, I would argue, should be 14 days, it, or it would be a very functional cycle. Because why? Well, triathletes are uh, are obsessed with getting in workouts of these from these all three different modalities, right? And they obsess over: uh, Should I get how many hard? Do I need a hard swimming? I need a hard running session. I need a hard cycling session, and and so forth. Well, seven days, you got no chance. But if you if you stretch it to 14 in your thinking, in your planning, now you can start to get some room in your program so that you can do some of these, you might call them key workouts, and still have sufficient air or sufficient, you know, recovery using low intensity sessions, filling those gaps. And, and that's the first thing I would change for most triathletes that, and it will let you lower your shoulders a bit and relax a little bit and not feel like you've got to cram every component of the training process into every seven day cycle because it's not sustainable. You won't be able to do it. Uh, and I think people who are trying are, are chronically tired. Um, so that's, that's definitely step one in, in my head. And, and the reason I say go to 14 is because then you still are tuned in. You're still aligned with, facility schedules and so forth. Does that make sense? Because generally the, the thing that gets us stuck in a seven day cycle are these routines around weekend versus work week and what's open, what's available. What do I have time for? Am I going to do my long run on Sundays, you know, and so forth. That's why the seven day cycle tends to be very, it's ingrained, you know, because it's so into the workflow and the, and the family flow and everything. So if you use 14 days, you're still at aligned with that, right? But you're giving your program more room. So that's step one. And then step two is, I would argue, to kind of flip on its head our mental thinking about the hierarchy of, of intensity, duration, and frequency. Because those are those three main components you have to control in your training. and if I'm thinking of a beginning triathlete, the first thing I'm going to try to work on is, is frequency, is saying, okay, what are your life demands, your work demands? What is this project for you? Is it a four day a week project or, a, or eight days per 14 days? Or is it, you know, is it a five day a week training? How much are you going to invest? And I'm not going to make judgments on whether three or four or five or six days a week is too much or too little, but we're going to be consistent. We're going to make that decision. And then now we're going to get comfortable with that frequency because that's the first step. And, and three, four is going to be better than three from a training perspective. Five will be better than four, but not as much better. You know, it, it, it's a law of diminishing return. So we want to find that frequency of training that fits into their life without causing breakdowns, divorces, and, and bad feelings, uh, and it's sustainable. And you're going to hear me say sustainable quite a bit because really endurance training is about sustainable, uh, a, a long-term process. None of this stuff happens overnight. There's, there's no magic three-week uh, cycle of training that's going to take you from poor to, to good as a swimmer or runner or cyclist. It's a, it's a, tr it's a process. And that's why we like it because it's a, it, it engages us for months and years. So we need to get cool, get to grips with that. And that means it's gotta be sustainable. So frequency first, establishing frequency, making it a habit, getting the brain kind of tuned into this is what I do four days a week or five days a week. Now, once I've got that as that frequency and I'm in balance, then I can start tuning in and, and adding duration. I can start extending some of those workouts. I'm still not worrying too much about intensity. Intensity takes care of itself. 
almost always the intensity ends up being too high at first anyway. So I'm going to go frequency first. Then I'm going to start stretching workouts because I've got to build extensive. A triathlon is all about extensive endurance, right? And now only at the top of that cake am I going to start adding in and, and thinking a lot about the high intensity sessions. But we very often have that flip flipped. Yeah, I think it's one of our favorite sense? things that you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Is is the fact that the whole most most of the training world has that flipped, and just the go to solution is to try and do more intensity. Um, I really want to talk about this this kind of pyramid approach um, with frequency at the bottom, then duration, then intensity. But before that, I mean, you dropped a bomb on us thinking about uh, the fourteen day cycle, and I'm glad you said it because it was one of the key topics we actually did want to bring up, and you uh, you brought it up <laughs> early. So now I want to dive into it because it's something we've been considering for a while, and uh, some of the drawbacks we've been wrestling with are the fact that yeah most most um, just age group or masters athletes have to do their endurance stuff on a weekend because they just can't fit in an endurance session during the week so can we explore that a little bit and what does a 14 day cycle look like uh, in your mind um, how does that play out and do they end up just doing you know one endurance ride and run endurance run over two weeks or do they still do them on the weekend and the weekdays are a little bit easier how does how does that actually unfold because we are really yeah. looking at this with our athletes what I would argue is, is that you don't, you don't need to do, you don't need to have a seven day uh, duration between two repeats of a type of training, like the long run. It, it doesn't have to be. Now, the long run might be important enough that we would do two of those in 14 days uh, to, you know, but, but other issues, for example, how do we distribute the interval sessions do we need to do equal numbers of a hard swim, hard bike, hard run each week? I would say no, we don't. That we can, you can, you can distribute that across fourteen days, and now you can wait. You can wait by you know you can you can emphasize and say, well, I need two hard two hard cycling sessions, but I only need one hard swim session in the fourteen days. Right. Or, you know, and, and, and this may be individual depending on the strengths and weaknesses of the athlete and where they are in their training program. Am I am I trying to improve my swimming? Am I trying to bring in some emphasis there? Am I trying to work on the run more? Now I've got 14 days and I can I can tweak up or down the, the, the length and the intensity of certain sessions. Uh, but just fundamentally, what that does is give you give your athlete more days to work with in the scheduling. So now, if you were at a fourteen day cycle and it's a, and they're a five day a week training athlete, now I've got ten days to think about and then and then position. And of those ten days, you know, probably seven of them should be at least not too crazy hard. You know, they should be more on that extensive side. And then maybe three of those days, it, it depends on the athlete. So I'm not going to get, you know, just totally locked into some very specific ratio, but I'm going to be sensitive to that ratio. I'm going to be listening to my body in terms of how I recover from certain kinds of workouts. And we are different there. You know, I, for example, I've got a lot of fast twitch fibers and I handle high intensity stochastic work pretty well. Threshold work kicks my butt. You know, a long threshold session will have me fatigued for a couple of days, whereas I can do the the high intensity stuff and feel good. So I'm but that's a function of my physiology. And you'll have another athlete that'll be the opposite. You know, so so that's one of the things that athletes need to kind of tune into is is which types of workouts cost me the most and require the longest recovery time. And I'm going to take that into account when I'm scheduling, you know, because it's the recovery clock that we kind of are managing. So our basic training sessions are on a 24 hour recovery clock. And what I mean by that is in essence, I can do the two, two and a half hour ride on Zwift and the next day, 24 hours later, I'm good to go. I'm good to do that again. 
right? I'm fully recovered based on heart rate, you know, whatever you want to use as indicators. Whereas if I do the hard interval session 24 hours later, I, you know, I may, my heart rate's a little bit, you know, too high or too low. I'm a little bit fatigued. My legs are a little bit, you know, I'm not fully recovered. Okay. So that clock may, may stretch to 48 hours and then, you know, killer epic workouts. We're, we may be on a three day, you know, recovery t- clock. And, and there's a reason why elite athletes don't do triathlons so very often because the stress of a, a, a full on all out triathlon takes maybe, you know, weeks to recover from at least mentally. So the, these, this recovery clock is what we're kind of managing, I would say, with our training distribution. I'm so in, in wrapped that you've actually mentioned that because this is, it's almost like the training program has been for, from generations and I, you know, I can go back to the being older than you, Steve, and to the, to the stuff that I saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s where it was, you didn't perform so well, so let's go and train harder to, to get ourselves per, performing the way we want to perform. And, and, and that has, and I tell our athletes, you know, if you train hard for a period of time, you will improve, but you will get to a point, like you said earlier, where your performance will stagnate and you will stay the same no matter how hard you train and then eventually you will get worse. You'll you'll get too tired, too too fatigued, and your performance will deteriorate rather than improve. And so, so now we're really flipping it and making recovery the key, and building that around the key sessions that we do. And the recovery is going to be the thing that makes you able to train harder when you want to train harder. And without that recovery, that is the key component to what you what you're trying to say. Um, without this. 48 hour, 72 hour, depending on what the effort you did in that previous high intensity session was, that's the thing that's going to make the difference between you being able to improve and not get fatigued so badly that you start to, you know, detrain and and almost have to take a break from the sport because you're so exhausted. Have you felt that that shift has come taken too long to get to this point um or or do you think it's just the way it's been and we're just learning so much more about about how the athlete functions are we better better at it what what are your thoughts on that it's a slow i well i think human human nature is kind of designed for that we tend to solve the problem of of you know failure with trying harder and that makes sense you know no pain no gain it kind of it's part of a mentality uh that is your default our default reaction to things is if if someone pushes me and i go back i push harder next time or i you know and and so i but even in the 60s we had arthur lydiard we had others that were kind of moving in in a different direction they were understanding the bigger picture they were doing a lot of the long slow distance and that so it hasn't it's not like it's only now we're understanding this but but i think the general understanding is getting better and i think it's really a good thing to that we have people studying sleep we have people studying uh, fueling the f- the eating part of all of this, and for the triathlete, that's the trinity. You know, train, eat, sleep, and 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 it, there was a wonderful interview. Uh, I think it was on another podcast, Rich Roll, and it was it was uh, Christian Blumen uh, and and Gustav Eden right after the Kona triathlon. Two days after they did, they showed up and did a nice interview. And that's what they talked about. They said, look, it's about eat, sleep, train. They they didn't do a bunch of fancy recovery stuff, but they were very tuned in to their eat, their fueling, and their and their sleep. And and we no, I mean they're, they're pro athletes, that's what they get paid to do. But the the mo- most of us, we we have issues with sleep. We have issues with eating because you know we we're busy. We we got kids. We've got different problems. I train more than I have in years because I don't have kids in the house right now. You know, so our lives go through different stages. And but it always comes back to those kind of three fundamentals is the body needs sleep. 
the body needs fuel and it particularly needs more fuel when we are pressing that part of the system a lot with with all these training sessions and when little imbalances happen you know we there's even now research that's suggesting that a lot of what we have traditionally diagnosed as an overtraining syndrome has probably been at least in part or maybe almost mostly an underfueling syndrome which has but they both end up showing the same symptomology in terms of how the athlete kind of breaks down when that balance is not aligned between energy demands and and, and the and the stress and activity level so uh, so even for the eight to ten hour a week athlete this can be a big issue you know just like the you know having the discipline to immediately after a training session mentally be thinking fuel in banana in you know begin to refuel reload glycogen because again we're on that recovery clock and now if i've done a really tough session i've really depleted glycogen levels in the musculature that's going to be the issue 24 hours later is have i recovered the glycogen stores right it's going to be one of the main limiting factors in fact some you can argue that at least part of the reason that we might do a a kind of a polarized distribution is because of energy issues. If you go out every day at threshold, glycogen availability becomes a limiting factor. Now, I don't think that's the main reason, but I do think that that's a, an issue that, that in terms of fueling. We always have enough fat available. We're not always good at using that fat, but glycogen is a limiting factor. I want to finish off uh, just one last question on the 14-day cycle um, kind of hypothesis and thinking about recovery and sleep. And um, the main principle you said there was that if you're thinking about a 14-day cycle, you have to do it starting with recovery in mind first. So, you're basically working around what are your recovery blocks. I'd just love to know specifically in your head uh, how you see that play out. Um, What's an example 14-day period of um, splitting up cycling running and swimming and i know that it depends on the the specifics of the athlete but we can assume that most athletes um, don't need to swim as much unless they're a horrific swimmer um if it's just a general athlete who's a decent swimmer they'll, they probably won't need to swim as much you spend the most time riding so it makes sense to probably do more high intensity or at threshold bike sessions um and then obviously running comes next so i'd love just a bit more insight in your head as to see it, as to how you see it playing out yeah well, yeah, by by duration, obviously, cycling is your key event. It, 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 but by uh, decisiveness, at least in, in Olympic triathlons and, you know, the higher level performers, it's the run that will decide who who comes out on top. Now, from a physiological point of view, you I think you could make a decent argument that that running can be a good general high intensity modality, you're going to activate, you're going to really drive cardiovascular function with running like heel repeats and so forth. Um, and that, sh- that is a general effect on cardiac function. That's going to kind of tr- cross over. Does that make sense? If, if we take things, central adaptations. So, so I'm, I'm, I think running would might be my default for, you know, I'm going to want to do that if I'm wanting to, to, to think hard adaptations. And then the cycling, as you say, is a bit more of an extensive uh, high intensity, meaning, you know, we're, we're around FTP, but we're not you're not really going to be cycling at VO2 max. You're not going to be pushing the, the throttle so hard, but you need to have really good uh, threshold power uh, if you're going to perform at a high level or, you know, and even for the age group or threshold power is going to improve your game. Right. So I would probably, if I'm thinking interval sessions, I would do my highest intensity interval sessions as runs, you know, to really drive cardiovascular function, but you don't need to do a lot of that. And then I would do a couple of cycling sessions that tend to be more, more extensive, extensive, longer intervals. If that makes sense, threshold, you know, it may be a threshold and then a a bit above threshold 
session or an over under type work, those kinds of sessions, but I'm using in, t in duration more on the cycling uh, sessions. And what makes a, a, a session hard? It's not, it's not just the intensity. It's the intensity times duration. You know, it's that area under the curve. And, and we know when athletes, if I, if I prescribe, for example, for my daughter, a four times eight minute interval session, you know, using duration, it, it could be, it could be meters on the track or whatever, but I want to have about eight minute durations. So we may start with three times eight, then go to four times eight, then maybe peak out at five times eight. So we're using, we're using accumulated duration as part of our signal. And then when five times eight is, is doable, without heart rate getting so high that she's crashing, you know, then we can now start bump, we can bump up the speed again. Does that make sense? So we use duration, the accumulated duration of the interval session as a very important part of the signal. And, and, and I think a lot of athletes under appreciate that. They think that they have to get faster. They've got to use that vertical part of the deal you know and try to go faster for the interval session to be better no if i can now do five times eight minutes and hit and and hold the same heart rate that i started with three times eight i am better and that is going to transfer directly to cycling yeah you with me yeah, yeah. so we've got to get our our athletes to think in terms of, of using both duration and intensity and what that does is give you a much more um, uh, fine detailed control of the total stress you're putting yourself at and and you can also see the improvement more clearly so it's kind of like a stair step where you you have a long the run and the rise and i'm going to use the run of the stair steps and i'm going to stretch that more and then I'm going to have small increments in intensity when I'm planning intervals. Okay. And then again, for cycling, I'm probably going to tend to be more extensively oriented. I'm going to be thinking extend power at time at power for running. I'm going to use VO2 max, you know, more high intensity intervals just to drive cardiovascular function uh, as a, as a kind of something works across the board it, it has value for the cycling as well it's 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 uh, yeah it's gold it's absolute gold to our ears i could listen to this all day and you can tell that you're a, a teacher as well because you explain it so effectively and this kind of leads into dad this discussion we were talking about and we want to get into and it's it's this question dad you've been asking about um, results from from a lot of VO2 max testing if you want to explain that um to Dr. Steve yeah so we we do send um Steve and a lot of our athletes to get uh, laboratory um, uh, VO2 testing to just really, oh, you know, for a the lot of reasons. The ones that yeah. want it, the ones that are serious. Um, we encourage it. And and a lot of the data that comes back um, is really helpful for us in, in terms of uh, understanding where their, where their training zones are and all the good the good things that we get out of the, the testing protocol. But one of the things that comes back almost – inevitably and invariably with every single person that I've sent to get tested is the the exercise physiologist in the lab sends me um, what I think this athlete needs more of. And without doubt, it's VO2 every single time. This athlete will do better if they do more VO2. I just want, I want to hear your thoughts on, on, you know, okay, so I've got that information. I know their training zones. My program wants to include the advice I'm getting from the exercise physiology lab. Am I doing the wrong thing by, say this is a beginner athlete or a, or a mid-pack athlete who's really just in the sport for for enjoyment, but they still want to improve. So let, let's make that clear. that they're, they're getting coached because they want to improve. And so are we, are we doing them a disservice by by hitting them with too much VO2 or, or, or not at all any VO2? What, what's your thought process on, on where we should be including it in their program? It's a curiosity why we tend to do that. But it, partly it may be that the physiologists maybe have a calibration of thinking that, well, VO2 max, if, if they're not hitting 70, it's just not good enough, you know, it's, it, because they see a lot of high elite athletes. Um, but the reality of it is, is most people can never get there. 
that that's 70 or 65 or whatever, those are high values. And, and, and Gustav Eden and Blumenfeld with 90 mLs per kg, that is extremely rare. And it doesn't happen for most athletes ever, no matter how much they train. And most of your age groupers, they're going to have a VO2 max of 50, 55. And, they're, and they need to be happy with that because that's pretty darn normal. Now, the, the fantastic thing about the triathlon, in opposition to, say, a 3,000 meter. Now, if, if they wanted to be a faster 3K runner, then I'd say, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, dude, but you're kind of out of luck with your 50 mLs per kg because you're not going to be able to run that fast for 3,000 meters. Uh, you probably should choose another sport, and that's why that's why we tend to go longer because the degrees of freedom for improvement in the triathlon are massively greater than the degrees of freedom for improvement in a 3,000 meter run on the track. Yeah. Let's just put, let's just be honest. Yeah. If you want to be, if you want to be Jakob Ingebrigtsen and win the 1500 <laughs> meter or the 5k, you have to have a very exceptional set of qualities. But if you want to get better as an age grouper in the triathlon, man, you've got so much stuff to work on. You've got so many different <laughs> ways to earn time. Right. And it's not going to be VO2 max. It's going to be the most important one. OK, because for the most part, the VO2 max of, a, of an age group triathlete, if they are doing normal doses of training, they're getting stimuli. They're getting stimuli. They're, they're climbing hills at a higher load. They're doing some FTP work. They're getting stimuli to cause what happens. The heart gets a bit, uh, you get some myocardial hypertrophy. You increase blood volume, which increases uh, stroke volume, which is one of the key issues for increasing VO2 max. And that adaptation, the VO2 max is usually the first thing that peaks out in an endurance athlete. The first thing, it's not the last thing. So when we bring in athletes into the lab, already at 18, 19, they've got the VO2 max they're going to have the rest of their career. All right? But they get faster. Why? Because of other adaptations. They're able to use a higher percentage of that VO2 max and use it longer. And that's the, you know, that's the key uh, in the triathlon. Yeah, that's an incredible point. Um, just a really good way to look at it. And we look, we we do know all the uh, exercise labs that we send them to. We send them to various ones and we do trust them a lot. Um, and I don't know if they're saying that... Um, that they look because they see their scores and they do average between forty five and and sixty plus sometimes. Um, but and I wonder if they're just saying that they've got a little bit more potential with VO two max. So so get that out. Um, or yeah, because it's like you said, it's this argument. I mean, they could be just at the moment performing, you know, at a slightly lower level than what their cap- capability is. And so with a solid block of VO two max training, they can get there and then bring it back to more triathlon specific race specific intensities yeah you have to also remember that when we do a vo2 max test uh, let's say it's a treadmill run part of it is 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 what should i say lactate tolerance Uh, because when they are pushing towards the max and we're starting to see really high ventilation and they are starting to struggle because now we are we know that if we could have a a probe inside their muscle. We know that blood, the muscle lactate is, is climbing. A lot of things are happening. They're starting to struggle. They're having to recruit more and more motor units to achieve that speed. They are really pushing the ragged edge. And so if, yeah, if you haven't been doing some, the, the high intensity work, then just the test, you, you just don't have that anaerobic capacity mm-hmm. to, to keep pushing f- hard long enough to really fully activate, fully mobilize the cardiovascular system. So there will be age group athletes, all types of athletes, but particular age groupers that may not actually reach a uh, heart rate max during the VO2 max test just because they, they fatigue 
peripherally before they fully mobilize centrally. Does that make sense? And and so that can be something that the the, the test person sees in a way in the data and sug- thinks, well, a bit of VO2 max intervals would help this out. They they would they would get a little bit of a jump. And and let's let's be let's be honest. If you're doing reasonable amounts of volume and you do a, a kind of a high intensity interval block, what is the effect size? All the research kind of goes in the direction of it's something like three or four percent. You know, it's not it's not nothing, but it's not massive. Right. Three or four percent. So let's say you had 50 mLs per kg. You can go. We might be able to bump you up to 52. 52, uh, really, you know, 50, 50 to 53. We're going to be happy with that. But you're not going to go to 65. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so that's kind of the scope. Now, this is assuming you're doing, you know, you've already got a normal, a fairly reasonable training volume, right? So you're, because another thing that, yeah. And another thing that people misunderstand is they think that only high intensity work improves VO2 max. That's totally wrong. Totally wrong. And, and that's just, and I say that with confidence, just because of what we see in 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 athletes and what happens when they train, and we see that VO two max will go up with more volume, also, right? In 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 athletes that are in that developmental period where they've still got a, a scope for improvement. I mean, we've got data for the whole careers of of athletes like cross-country skiers that have been among the best in the world and their VO2 max didn't really hit the peak until they had sufficient volume. It wasn't, it wasn't the intensity stuff that was the difference maker. It was, they had to reach a certain volume. Then they hit, for example, female cross-country skier hitting 70 mLs per kg. Uh, that's when they started climbing to the podium and they kept climbing to the podium, but their VO2 max stayed stable for the next 10 years. Right. It didn't keep getting better. Really incredible. I mean, can you can you clarify, especially when you talk about um, frequency first, then volume, then intensity? Is that meaning there's you're looking for no intensity to start with, no high intensity sessions? You're just looking to increase volume. I mean, I, I know I don't want to go extremes, no. but but yeah. no, but what I what I'm trying to particularly, I, I did a I did some work with. Uh, Adidas and they had a program, you know, they were introducing a new shoe that was aimed at beginning runners and, and beginning athletes. If, if I start at that end of the spectrum, you know, you've got people listening that are really new into the triathlon and maybe haven't been doing a lot of this training stuff. And so if we think about them, the first thing we want to do is establish the habit of training, the frequency that it becomes, you know, because training is a, is, it is an addictive thing. Our brains, you know, our brains tend to have an addictive tendency on certain kinds of stimuli, but the, but train is not a strong addiction. It's not like some of the chemical addictions that we, we sometimes struggle with. Training will become somewhat addictive. It will meaning that we tend to want it once we do it enough, but getting there, the initial phase from doing no training to doing regular training, that's not an easy transition. It's not one of these, oh, that felt good immediately. A lot of athletes say, no, man, it sucked. It was, I was sore for days and I, my body was rebelling against all this stuff I'm trying to do. So it takes time. Well, in that phase, what I'm saying is I want to really focus on just that transition of getting out the door. Does that make sense? Is is building it into their life because let's face it, most people have a life from before. They they don't have just hours and hours of free time that they've been waiting to fill with some new hobby. No, they they've already had a busy life and now they've discovered triathlon, the ultimate time, you know, vac time magnet. You know, <laughs> and so because you can use as much time on it as you can as you want. Right. You're never going to have too much time for training for the triathlon. 
So we've got, I'm going to focus on helping that athlete establish a sustainable habit frequency wise. And during that time, I'm not going to be too worried about what they put into it. I got to, if I get them out the door on a cycling session, on a run, on a swim, I'm happy. And it's, and it's developing as a habit and they're feeling good about it. And then we can start going into their training peaks or whatever and say, well, how, how long are these sessions? Well, my runs are about 30 minutes. Okay. Well, let's start thinking about lengthening one of those runs each week. You know, we'll start with that. And we're going to stretch that towards an hour or toward, you know what I'm saying? So you just start, you start pu- tweaking and pulling a bit, but always based on clapping them on the back and saying, man, this is so great. You're getting out the door five times a week now, you know, six times a week. This is awesome. You know, you have got, you, you are building a training foundation. And so that's that platform. The frequency is, is what, is what kind of, uh, creates the platform for success, I would say. And then, and then we add it in, we add in the, the, or we tweak in du- the, the extensiveness or the duration, and then we tweak the intensity. They're going to get some intensity automatically. And particularly when they're fairly low, uh, poorly trained, it, their scope from low intensity to high intensity is not very big. Well, it's just exactly what you mean by them getting intensity. Um, would that be a case of if you, if in that example you just used, if the athlete starts to go, all right, let's take these 30 minute runs to 45 minutes or 60 minutes, they might be the same pace, but just because of their fitness level, they'll get a little bit of cardiac drift um, just over an hour period. And that's where a little bit of intensity or stress on the body is coming. Is that how we should? Yeah. Put and it? they're going to, they're going to, they're going to hit a hill. They're going to come up on hills. They're going to, they're going to, and, and, and they're going to tend to push the hills a bit. You know, they're going to try to hold cadence and they're, so they're going to push the watts up or the, you know, and the, hold the speed. Heart rate's going to go up. It's very difficult to come be on a flat course, hit a hill and hold intensity at, at the same level. So the hill will tend to naturally drive some some cardiovascular load. You know, so what I'm just saying is that organically our, our age group athletes, when they're first starting out, it's really not a problem for them them to get intensity because it's kind of happening whether they like it or not they don't have really good metabolic control they don't have and they don't have a big scope uh a big range so the difference between uh zone one low intensity below threshold and above threshold hard interval in terms of speed running is not very big right so they don't have a lot of room for error a lot of margin for error and then as they get fitter, as they do get a bit more VO2 max, as they do build out some metabolic control, lactate stays low, then they start to be able almost to train in a polarized way. It's pretty tough to train polarized when you're really just starting out. Does that make sense? Because some, if you're talking, you know, some that maybe they're a bit overweight, they're you know, really starting out young, early, they may have to walk up those hills. Right during an easy run, that has really helped a lot of the newcomers to triathlon. I'm sure who are listening. What about Stephen? Those who are really well trained and they're they're searching for for a program that's going to take them to the next level. And and you know they're the ones who who are already have got that resilience um, from the frequency that they've got that duration. They've got the volume already. You know, let's talk specifically about you know, getting into the nitty gritty of the intensity, should they be doing, you know, more VO2, more threshold or make it so particularly accurate to their race requirements if they're doing a 70.3 or an Olympic? You know, you've already got a 40K time trial compared to a 90K time trial where one's close to your threshold and one's close to more like sweet spot sub-threshold. And then you get to an Ironman where it's almost you're riding at tempo. Um, for for six hours. Um, so yeah, let's talk to your opinions on on the, the athlete at the other end who's who's really searching for that. What should I be doing in my intensity? I've already got the frequency and duration nailed. Where's my next step? And I and I find in general endurance sports are are being uh, influenced by 
the power of, of television, the power of the view, you know, how we want to package the product, the triathlon. And, and, and what is that doing? Well, it is making race courses, for example, Olympic distance courses are becoming tighter with more, for example, 90 degree turns, more little short hills. So they're more like a criterium and less like a traditional flat time trial. So one of the issues for elite performers, the high level athletes who are doing some Olympic distance type stuff is that the bike segment is if we look at the power distribution on the bike segment, it is not steady at 350 watts or steady at 380 or 400 watts. It is quite spiky because of the course and they have, they can't, they can't use an even distribution of power. They'll lose. They will lose time. They'll lose the, the, the uh, group. They have to ride in a more stochastic way. So the pacing issue for the, the, particularly the bike has changed or, you know, our, our traditional argument that you want really even pacing. That's true if you have a really even course, right? Out and back, flat as a pancake, then yeah, then you're going to find an exact watts and you're going to try to hold that. But that's not what those races are looking like these days. They are much more stochastic and you've got to have the ability to handle those repeat accelerations. And so that would, in, that would influence how I would prepare for uh, these, these races, depending on what kind of course it is and whether I'm talking Olympic distance or half marathon, half Ironman or, or Ironman, because that's going to dramatically change the limiting factors. So let's take it back a level to the top end sort of age group, not even the top end, just someone who's well-trained, maybe up to the top end age group, who are most likely doing a, whether it's an Olympic up to Ironman, it will probably be some sort of out and back and it'll probably be relatively more even power. Can we ask that same question? Should they be focusing on um, really uh, that, that those threshold style sessions of longer duration, um, or should a lot, a lot of their blocks be pushing up to that higher VO2 max power? You know, of, of a high power longer rather than a higher power for the same duration. I mean, you know, I'm going to think, well, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is just the, the, for the power velocity relationship that I've got to, if I want more speed, I've got to have, you know, the, the relationship is, is exponential. So it takes a pretty big jump in power to get a real jump in speed. That's why it's difficult to break away, right? But if I can extend the duration that I can hold power and my ability to transition to the run rapidly, these places are where you suddenly can earn chunks of time um, that that are really meaningful. Whereas if I do a 10-watt increase in my max power, that's not necessarily going to translate to the to the long bike as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tend to think in terms of uh, for the most part extending extending time at power and and improving transition capacity, if that makes sense. <laughs> It does, and I've heard you talk about even taking. You know, we we talk about the five zone model and the three zone model, um, and I've even heard you start saying now that you just refer to it as, as as two zones, as either just easy or hard. And can you explain a little bit about that? I mean, the body doesn't know exactly when you're yeah. in VO two max versus just threshold. Is it if I if I prescribe an interval session to an athlete, it depends a little bit on the particulars of the session, but they may move through three different intensity zones in a five zone model during the workout, right? The the first, let's say it's four times eight minutes, uh, just as an example, because I've seen a lot of these, the first bout, they may be at thresh, what looks like threshold heart rate. They're at the up, they finish, they're at the upper end of zone three in that five zone model. The second bout and the third, they're in zone four, and the fit, the fourth bout, they're tweaking zone five. You with me? 
So in the course of that interval session, they have they've crossed through three zones if we look at heart rate or if we look at perceived exertion, right? And even blood lactate will be, it'll be drifting up. It'll be probably quasi steady by the third interval. But so it's not a steady state, even though they may do all four of those bouts at the same power. The body is, is fatiguing. The efficiency of the musculature is actually going down. The brain is having to recruit more what we call motor units, more of these groups of muscle fibers uh, to they're having to call the brain's having to call in reinforcements as fatigue ensues. And the reinforcements are type two fibers. They're more fatigable. They use more. They burn hotter, you know, in terms of the glycogen burn. So uh, a lot of things are happening. There's no such thing as a steady state in training, actually. You know, it's all time limited. So even those long runs and long rides, you know, you start and you look at heart rate and it's flat and that's good. But then at some point it starts going up. It starts yeah, inching up. It's and, not, yeah. Right. So you have a finite steady state period, you might mm-hmm. say. And and I'm always what we're thinking about as triathletes is trying to extend that. And that's this durability concept that's been kind of we've kind of brought into the into the discussion here. Because we've always, what do we do when we bring people into the lab? We measure three things. We measure mostly VO2 max, and then we measure threshold, which is just, in a sense, what percentage of VO2 max can you work at for a long time? And, and, and we define that in different ways. And then the third thing we measure is efficiency or economy. And that just connects the, the motor to the velocity. How, how much is it costing? to move your body at that speed or to generate that power. So those are the three traditional components. Measure anaerobic capacity, but it's not that important. Now we're starting to say, yeah, well, the problem with that is, is that when we bring people into the lab, we warm them up for 15 minutes, we do the test, they're always fresh. We've always said, don't train hard the day before, don't you know we do everything we can so that they are the best version of themselves for the test all right that's great but <laughs> here's the deal that version of you is already gone after an hour in a triathlon it's it's sailed that ship sailed you're no longer that athlete you've already started deteriorating i'm sorry but that's just what's happening okay and so my job as your coach is to try or or my job as an athlete is to extend out and say, well, how what percentage of me at my best do I still have four hours in? What percentage of me at my best can I still bring to bear on that darn marathon in, in Kona? Right. I mean, look at the Kona Marathon, look at Gustav Eden, look at that race. If you want to understand this, that's what you see, is you see an athlete that hangs in there. He's not the best swimmer. His his cycle is not the best either in that day, but he is managing his body. He's a good runner. And not only is he a good runner, he's a good second half marathon runner. And that's where he eats eats up the field. I mean, he destroys the competition in the in the last half marathon. That's where they yeah. cannot compete with him. Right. I'm so glad you you brought that up because we talk a lot about these training principles and what we've just spoken about for the last half hour. It is it is definitely a conservative approach, you would say, and that's necessary because, as you've explained, we just tend to jump to intensity way too much, but. At the opposite end of the spectrum, those Norwegian boys put a lot of their training online and it's, it's a lot of it's on YouTube, a lot of it's on Strava and some of their sessions completely defy these training principles and kind of kind of throw these, these rules out the window a little bit. I don't know if I'm just reading that wrong, but some of their days are monstrous, um, swimming, biking and running um, and they're doing them. I know they're having a lot of recovery between, but they're, they're really stacking so much intensity into one day that it, it just seems unfathomable. Why? Because now let's go back to what we talked about earlier. We talked about the recovery clock, 
right? And alignment of the recovery clock. I, what we see, and I've even said the same thing. I said, if you're first going to do the hard day, the hard session, and let's, let's think of it this way. It's now I made it a hard day. I have, you know, because the, the body doesn't really distinguish sessions as saying, you know, what is the state of my body? So now if I'm already going to challenge my body, turn on that, that sympathetic nervous system response, I'm going to generate this. I'm going to now go to a longer clock for recovery. I'm not, and I'm really fit like they are. I mean, they are world-class athletes. Then they say, well, let's go ahead and stack the stimuli and align those stimuli so that now the recovery clock is aligned and I then have the easy sessions after. Does that make sense? So they've said, I've done a hard swim, a hard bike, and a hard run on one day. Well, that's crazy. Well, yeah, it's crazy in the sense that it's a hard day, but now I get two days of recovery. Now I have two, now I have aligned these and the recovery clock is lined up instead of having multiple days with hard sessions. So I would argue that their logic is sound. And we see the same thing, for example, Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who, for those who don't know, is, you know, Olympic champion in the uh, middle distance athlete. He's 1248, 5,000 meter runner and probably sub, sub, sub 27, 10K runner. So he stretches across a pretty big spectrum fitness wise. And running wise, he, he he's done the same thing. I mean, they have literally had days where they had a race. And so now they've done a hard warm up. They've, they've done the race. But then they say, well, that wasn't that much of a stimuli. <laughs> so let's do some intervals after the race. So they've been on the track after the, the race was over doing intervals because they want to get the most out of that hard day. Same, yeah. same logic. Yeah. I think it speaks to exactly what you said a couple of minutes ago and that um, they and the Norwegians, it also makes a lot of sense because when they have this big day, they're actually doing this hard bike session and, and then doing the hard run session, um, building that fatigue. And it's the exact same as what they would do in a race. So they're actually doing all these sessions, hitting these numbers, uh, feeling the fatigue that they will in the race, which has to, has to um, help, right? Recovery, some micro recovery in fueling advantages of, of being able to break it up with some a couple hours in between or whatever they're using but yeah it's it's more realistic in terms of when they hit the run they've already got accumulated fatigue just like it's going to be so probably it's a mental issue as well as they're just say well this is what this is i'm in my comfort zone because this is we're we're trained for this uh and they are uh, but but i do think that's and and, and even with research way back in in years ago on horses race horses what they found was is that they could intensify their hard days and they 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 managed it but if they made their easy days harder the horses fell apart this was bruin years ago and this was one of the the studies that kind of was formative in terms of overtraining and and in intensity distribution and and it and it speaks to this fundamental issue of hard days hard easy days easy and hard days can be very hard if you give sufficient room in the program for recovery and maybe this is an argument for the 14 day cycle for the the age grouper that works full time you know stack the stack the midweek sessions a bit more do a morning and night session you might not have time to do both sessions before or after work, but really stack that day, then have a full day, two days off and repeat that over 14 days. Oh, if you're thinking recovery, you're saying, I got to sleep, I got to eat, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so you have mm -hmm. to be attentive to it's, it, there has to be an intentionality. So we don't want to think of so-called, I, I, I don't even like the term easy days because it tends to give the wrong impression. And, and, and we hear people use in terms like junk miles, well, this is just this is an unfortunate term and it's and it's wrong in the sense that it suggests that really all that matters is the hard sessions and the easy days are just filler <laughs> to get us to the next hard mm -hmm. session. That's that's wrong uh, based on everything we've seen with with high performance athletes. The the low intensity volume is it actually helps build a platform to tolerate 
the high intensity. So they are, there's a synergy, a symbiosis in a, in a training program that has what you might, my daughter called it flow. She said, Papa, now my training is, I'm in flow. And what she was trying to say was, is that balance was achieved and the low intensity and high intensity were kind of complementary. They were, they were mm-hmm. building each other. Right. And, and that's, I think the way we should be thinking about the training is don't think of the low intensity sessions as, ah, this is just trash. My, you know, I, I can't wait till the next meaningful session. No, it's, it all is very meaningful. It all is part of a, a totality of stimulus of preparation for the war of the event, you know, the battle, let's say maybe not war, but the battle. And so uh, I think when we have that mentality, then those low intensity sit- sessions are done with more intentionality. You, you know what I'm saying? That more purposefulness. Yeah. Uh, yep. That when I go out, when I do the two hour, uh, three hour ride, there's purpose in that ride. It's not just wasting, filling time. Yep. And, and then even yep. in that ride, I can be attentive to specific issues. For example, my my drinking schedule, my cadence, you know, mm-hmm. and so I encourage athletes to use the long sessions to work on details. Yep. Right. With intentionality. This day, this three hour session, I'm particularly focused on my breathing. And in fact, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to breathe. No mouth closed during the whole ride. I've done that myself just to work on yep. controlling breathing. So, so every, the, every low intensity session, there's potential to, to learn, to work on details of how do I manage my body for maximal, um, what should I say? Sustainable for durability. Mm-hmm. How do I work on management issues? And, and, and when we have that mentality, we get more out of the training and we have a, again, I think I, I use that word intentionality. There's an, there's a purpose, yep. there's a focus in every workout, even the low intensity sessions, we can use them as a teaching moment or te- either teaching, you know, intellectually, but also teaching the body, right. In a way. That's great. And I wanted just to pick up on one of the things that you've said um, when we talked about the high intensity session. We've really looked in detail about the the zone two session and not getting out of that zone, staying staying predominantly in that zone and maybe being well below the zone two and working ourselves up to zone two limit. I want to talk about the high intensity session where we, we use the example of the four by eight, which we were talking about before. And you're, you're suggesting that we could cross across zone three, four, and five in that particular session. Is it, is it the same principle that we shouldn't go into zone five when we're trying to do a threshold session that does create such stimulus on our body that we are crossing into a zone where if we're trying to teach our body to stay for longer time in that threshold, zone say we're picking zone three touching on zone four should we just try to drop the power down and stay stay in that zone rather than let our body get more stress from from the session being too hard um yeah what are your thoughts on that uh and and i again can exemplify with my own daughter as a runner um you know 116 half marathon so pretty solid runner um (laughs) <laughs> and 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 came from dance so she had 10 years of dance and then transitioned into running and it went pretty fast but she and coached by you nonetheless. yeah but and mostly she's just pretty smart kid but 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 also pretty yeah. driven and the problem she faced was that when i would prescribe something like a four four times eight minute session which for most people will kind of naturally put them in zone four she would bring a big shovel and dig and end up in zone five, you know, racing the interval session. Does that make sense? And, and, and if she didn't go faster for that, then it was a failure. So she had this 
racing mentality on that session. And it ended up, she dug a hole for herself. She didn't recover from those sessions very well. And so what we ended up having to do, instead of me saying four times eight minutes at maximum session effort, which would work maybe for some people, for her, it was pushing her too hard. So I said, no, four times eight minutes at 90%. And then she then she you know brought down the speed and just like you're saying, uh, Jared is she kept it under control, didn't push over into zone five as much and recovered much faster. And then everything that's when she said, "Now I'm in a flow." Yeah. And now it's yeah. flow, and it's not think- you know I'm saying well, Steve. So you're basing your whole philosophy on your daughter? No. What we we see exactly <laughs> the same. <laughs> She's just a good example because we see the exact same thing in elite performers is when we've gone in and looked at their training distribution over time, they're tends, they tend to back down a bit and, and accumulate minutes in that zone four or upper zone three area. Okay. They don't go into zone five very often in training, but they can race there like rowers, you know, rowers are racing in zone five and, you know, and, and beyond, but they don't do a lot of zone five training because it's just really tough. It's costly. And, and there is, you can say that it, the zone four work scales up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. there's a, it, it scales up. That's what you're up. saying before about you, you don't have to do VO2 max work to improve your VO2 max. That's what you mean. It scales yeah, up. Yeah, it, it does scale up. And up. so we we tend to see that if we were going to, if I was going to say, yeah, polarized training, where are the poles? Where are the attractors, the intensity attractors in a two, in a, you know, if we think physics and astronomy or whatever, then I would say, yeah, it's somewhere around 60% here. 60, it depends on what you're 60% of what, but uh, maybe 65% of heart rate max. And then it's somewhere around 90, nine, you know, it might start at 87 and end up at 92, three, but it's somewhere around 90 in those high intensity sessions. So, 65, 90 might be kind of general attractors. Now, please don't interpret that as, a, well, if I'm not at 90, it's wrong. If I'm not at 60, it's, no. But those are kind of the magnetic poles in, the, in that uh, polarized model, it seems. Okay? So the, 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 the problem with a polarized, with that term, is that if you take it to its complete logical maximum, then that becomes a hundred, you go absolutely as hard as you can, right? That's how you polarize is the hard becomes just harder and harder and harder. No, that's, that's an unfortunate interpretation of, of polarized distribution. And, and, and to add to that, while I'm on the topic, when we first understand what's being polarized, which I believe is stress, the stress response, then that means that a, a hard threshold session, a hard zone four session or zone five, they are all hard, but they're hard as a function of different combinations of intensity and duration. Does that make sense? Would you, would, would you say that's the biggest misconception of the polarized model yeah. is that because the, the tagline is you can go easier on your easy days so that you can go harder on yeah. your hard days and, and then people just go harder, harder, harder. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, and that's, if if I'm the grandfather of this, then that's my <laughs> fault for using a term that seemed good at the time. But any term you <laughs> use can be misinterpreted. And certainly it is possible to interpret polarized as, you know, just keep, especially on the high intensity, just keep pushing it out, out, out. That will get you in big yeah. trouble. And that's not what athletes do. What is yep. fundamental about the polarized model is that the athletes have understood the value of low intensity. And when I say low, I don't, mm. you know, low is relative. Let's keep it, the, mm-hmm. you know, cause you got to remember, uh, let's say and Niels von der Poel, this speed skater who, who did a really nice, he kind of manifesto of how he trained to break world records. And, you know, you know, he was doing 260 Watts on the bike for six hours in his low intensity sessions. Uh, that, that's not, that's not, you know, lazy. <laughs> so, so, so just so <laughs> we're clear yeah. on what, yeah. when we say easy, everything's relative here, you know, but for mm-hmm. him who could hold 
400 watts for 90 minutes, three times 30 minutes, yeah, 260 was low intensity. So we just, we need to keep that in mind. It's it's ironic that uh, the summary of this episode is we that we we're putting too much emphasis on high intensity, and you do preach this message a lot, which I um, am, am thankful for because it's obviously it's needed in the industry. But um, at the same time, all of our questions have been around high intensity and not focusing on volume and frequency. And I'm going to ask one more question on intensity, and that's how do you respond to the the argument that uh, older athletes or aging athletes or masters athletes should avoid high intensity, it's it's risky, quote unquote risky. Some objective truth to that from the standpoint of that, you know, some of the aging issues, what happens with aging, there is some for sure muscu- muscle, muscle, tendon changes that make the tendon stiffness tends to increase. So for sure, age groupers who jump out on the court and want to play basketball and they haven't in 20 years, they are just a candidate for an Achilles rupture. Uh, so that's true, you know, because of tendon stiffness, that's an age, an age related mm-hmm. change, another age related change that is what we call obligatory, meaning you can't keep it from happening is that maximum heart rate will slowly go down, uh, in the aging athlete, there is a decrease in, in, you might say that maximum sympathetic stimulation and the responsiveness of the heart to that. So we all know that for most of us, we can say, yeah, I can remember when my max heart rate was 190, but now it's 174, you know, Mm -hmm. that that's a generalizable change. Uh, But it doesn't mean the heart's not healthy. It's just it has there is a change in its responsiveness to stimulation. Uh, And then the third big aging issue that I would argue is is just loss of muscle mass. Uh, there's a generalizable kind of a, it's been called sarcopenia. We always have to have a Latin term for, for stuff. And all that just is less muscle, you know? <laughs> so, and, and, and so as we get older, we do lose muscle mass and we lose it preferentially kind of in the, the type two motor units, the, the power, and we lose it in that, in those big muscles, like the, the, the butt, the hips, you know? So we lose that, that acceleration and power capacity. Well, this is why age group athletes tend to migrate from the shorter distances to the longer distances because they play to their strengths and and mm. they're they're kind of smart, you know, <laughs> they may not realize it but that's smart <laughs> because mitochondrial function is not deterred is not deteriorated by aging. So the the relative functional peripheral capacity of the aging athlete is just as good. So that that's the good news, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Is in, in fact, you can even have athlete, you can have people that have heart disease and their, their threshold intensity is like 90, 95% because they have such good peripheral adaptations, but they've got a heart issue. So they, they actually are, have a higher threshold than they, than normal because they have a lower max capacity. So, yeah, so that's yeah. the aging problem. Now, is, is Steven Seiler at greater risk of, uh, because he's now 57 instead of 27, is he at greater risk when he does intervals? Maybe technically, but I would argue that because I'm 57 and I'm still going strong and haven't had a heart attack, probably that's an unlikely event now that I've moved past the, the, the point where that was a high risk issue. If I had a hereditary problem where lots of people had had heart attacks in my family at age 50, yeah, that would have been an issue, but I don't. And I didn't, I had an issue of arrhythmias, you know, so the heart I've, I've talked before, the heart's a pump and it's an electrical device at the same time. And the pump Mm -hmm. function and it's also a muscle that needs oxygen. The pump function, you know, it depends on it. It has to get oxygen. So heart attacks happen when when some part of the heart's own uh, oxygen supply get get gets cut off. And that's that happens over time. You know, you have problems with these coronary arteries and it's so particularly mm-hmm. it's pretty genetic. There is a high genetic component to it. So you can have people that could be in a very high risk zone just because of 
the genetics, you know, they, their dad died at 45 and their, you know, and their uncle and, 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 uh, you know, I'm just being honest. And then there's the arrhythmia part, which seems to be somewhat more training. You know, there may be a training issue where people who have trained a lot may increase their disposition for, for example, atrial fibrillation. You know, I've had atrial fibrillation myself, uh, which, you know, that, yeah. that small chamber that's kind of the waiting room for the ventricles starts quivering. The ventricles are still pumping because if they don't pump, you die. But the atria can quiver yeah. and, and you can survive, but it's very uncomfortable and you don't have the, the, the right, you don't have maximum pumping efficiency. So, so atrial fibrillation. It happens quite a lot in triathlon. Yeah, well, right? it happens quite a lot. It yeah. seems some have argued that it's kind of a the middle-aged man epidemic, you know, that, 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 of people like me that train quite a bit and, and that maybe that is somehow mm. creating an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. I can say, and there was a nice book written by, on that by a guy named Chris Case, uh, Fast Talk uh, Laboratories. He wrote a book, The Haywire Heart. Uh, with a couple of very good cardio, cardiovascular experts, you know, and and I can recommend that book if you're dealing with these issues yourself. I've had atrial fibrillation. It is a risk for athletes, the, 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 the arrhythmia part of it. I can say in my case, what I found, I had a period of my life where I was in a, in a leadership role at the university. I had a lot of stress in my life both family mm. and, and work, and I developed the atrial fibrillation during that period in my life. And I had to really shut down the training. I had to, I had to quit doing the interval stuff because if I tried to do interval training, I was getting my heart up in my throat. I mean, I was just feeling it wasn't yep. responding appropriately. Uh, and I gave it a couple of years where I just didn't do much of, of any kind of high intense work. And, and I made some changes in my life. You know, and I decrease hmm. stress. Now, fast forward a few years later, yep. I I'm hitting heart rate max regularly during races and that, you know, and I have had no issues. So and I haven't had hmm. an arrhythmia, a, a serious a, a, like a pure atrial fib episode in five years, four at least. Is that a common response to backing off? Lifestyle changes. I, I, I'm just, I guess all, all I want to argue is, is that. Um, the heart is also, you know, I've said it's a pump. I've said it's an electrical device. I've said it's a muscle. The fourth thing it is, is a stressometer. It is a stress meter because it is tapped okay. in the, you have the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulus coming in from the, the medulla from the brain. And it is responsive to these stimuli. And it is kind of a, re, it's a window into the stress of the, of the person, you know, yeah. through heart rate variability, yeah. through heart rate, morning heart rate, all of yeah. these things. So all I would argue is, is that <laughs> stress is not coming from one direction in our lives. And, and as age group athletes in particular, in some ways, age group athletes are bigger heroes than elite athletes because the age grouper <laughs> yeah. has to juggle more stress sources. The elite athlete has the luxury mm -hmm. for a certain period in their life of saying, well, I don't do that part. I don't do the high stress job right now. I don't do, I only do the training part, you know? And so they get to select the sources of stress and reduce the, the, the degrees of freedom. Most of us don't have that luxury, or at least we have to be really, yeah. it takes a lot of effort uh, to make changes in our yeah. life to reduce stress. Um, but the heart is, you know, there are, that's why kind of heart rate variability has become so popular because it's a somewhat omnibus uh, indicator the, it, and it responds to stress sources of various, you know, anything from drinking four beers the night before to the high intensity interval session to COVID-19 infection. It's, it is, mm. it, it is, responsive to various sources of stress that's it's a, a point that i wanted to actually uh, bring up and I, i've used heart rate variability for almost 
eight or nine years uh, and I've got a lot of historical data from my own personal journey and and I was saying to Jordan earlier today we were hoping to t- touch briefly on heart rate variability and and a lot of our athletes are being dictated to by what they wake up and find from their whatever app that they're using is telling them that they're stressed today highly stressed and they shouldn't train and in my experience from the, the the years that i've been using it is that i don't use it that way um and one of the reasons i i didn't do that was because whenever i had a key race that i was aiming for over a you know a four or five month period the day and the day of the race my heart rate variability told me that i shouldn't do anything today and I should rest. <laughs> That's because and, you're stressed. And you're I excited. would be saying, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly my point. And yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get this across. It, it, it will pick up on any stress levels. My my oh, adrenaline yeah. was so at its extreme level that I, and I knew after a period of time when I finally worked it out myself that I'm in for a great day today. Not exactly. only do I not have to yeah. rest, but I'm going to go out there and yeah. race my butt off because. Uh, because my heart rate variability is telling me I'm in a very stressed state of mind, and and I think that's a, just an example of I want you to to touch on. We shouldn't be dictated to by this this the stuff that we see coming back at us on these on these screens. Yeah. And how would you use them the best yeah. way possible? Yeah, and I use the term of uh, the Holy Trinity, uh, partly because my grandpa was a preacher, you know, and so I, I've still got a little of that in my background. Uh, but the Trinity is is, a sun, is triangulation, and we know triangulation is a conceptualization. You know that you use multiple inputs to to get the truth to either where am I or what, and and that's used in GPS. You know the your satellite navigation system is based on triangulation, and your monitoring of your your training should be based on triangulation. So let's so now he says, well, Stephen, what do you mean? Well, tri- triangle three points, right? What are they? Well, in general, the one is just the external load that I can actually measure. And we've never been more capable of measuring the actual work done and the intensity for, you know, the power output. That's the that's the output. What did I do? You know, I did two hours at 225 watts. All right. That's the external load. Okay, But what did it cost? Well, there's two ways of measuring that. There's some physio- physiology. I can measure heart rate drift. I can measure blood lactate. I can measure oxygen consumption in a laboratory. I'm not going to do that out in the field. I can measure breathing. That's something we're doing a lot more of these days is measuring ventilation. But I can measure some physiology, and, and, and those will generally show me that, again, there's no steady state. So there's a, there's a relationship between that internal physiology and that external workload, and it changes during workouts. It also changes with training, hopefully for the better, you know, that higher power, but, but same heart rate. That's a good change in general, uh, in a, in a long-term way. So that's, that's the second. And then the third is perception. Our brains are integrators of information. Our brains are receiving both feedback from the body and feed forward information as we as we turn up the volume, as we turn on more muscle, our brains are sensitive to this. And so this gives us a tool, we often call it perceived exertion, you know, like the Borg scale, of, you know, where are you? How do you feel? And we can use it both acutely, you know, saying, where are you right this in this in this interval bout? And it was 14, and now it's 15, and now it's 16. It's going up. The perceived exertion is going up, even though power is staying even. That's typical. Uh, and we can also use it more as a, as a, you know, how is the whole session or how, to, you know, so there's different ways of using the perceptual measures. But when you combine those, the perceptual measures, the physiology, which can include heart rate variability on that physiology side and the external power, now I have – a, a triangulation that that offers me a kind of checks and balances system. If you understand, I learned when we learned about civics or government, we learned about how the government is supposed to work, right? Your judicial branch and your executive branch, and and that and and how they kind of balance each other out in a well functioning democracy. Well, same thing here. They they if we get the monitoring right, then the strengths and weaknesses of the different methods 
balance each other out. So I'm never going to depend 100% on one measure like heart rate variability. There's no way I'm going to, and, and, and I got to be honest, I don't use heart rate variability like that. I've used it in research a bit. I've, I've, I've looked at it myself, but I don't do it on a daily, daily basis. I depend more. I, I, I get a bit of, you know, how is my body responding during the warm up? I, I, you know, general perceptual stuff. What's my Watts. I typically look a lot at whether my, cause I, when I'm tired, my heart rate will tend to not come up like it should. It'll, t- the brakes will come on. So I know my fatigue responses pretty well. Others will be a bit different depending on the kind of fatigue it is, the fatigue of a hard strength session and what it does to my cycling the next day versus the fatigue of a, of a hard race or interval session and what it does to my heart rate the next day. Those are different, right? And, and so there's no one variable that I would feel comfortable saying that's your magic monitor value and heart rate variability is not. And, and, and I know, for example, uh, Marco Altini, wonderful. He's got the app uh, heart rate for training. So I'm giving him a free plug, but it's a good, he's, he's a great guy. He does, he's an engineer, PhD in engineering. He's developed a great tool that's based on the smartphone technology and it works, it's validated, it works, but he will also tell you that that's not the only thing you're going to look at, right? He will be honest and say it's a tool and, and it goes into your toolbox, right? But you don't, I don't know of any carpenter that's just got one tool in the toolbox. Yeah. That is the one of the top lessons we, we tell our athletes all the time is especially when they get they get down about their power in a race or and so often athletes will see their power was down even though their speed was up, you know. And um, it's exactly yeah, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. It's it's um understanding, yeah, that I love that triangle analogy of there are always so many components to um what you should be looking yeah, at. Yeah, so you in of, of values and the other the other kind of metaphor i like to use is what's called what we call the heads up display if you if you're into any kind of military stuff you know the fighter pilots they they're pretty amazing men and women but in terms of what they can keep their eyes on but you want to if you're traveling at i don't know what they're traveling at a thousand kilometers an hour or something you know 800 900 kilometers an hour flying through the air you need to be looking forward right you need to have your eyes on the prize uh, or else bad things are going to happen. But then at the same time, you got all this information. You got all these cockpit dials and, and, and numbers that they need to, that are relevant, you know, fuel and flaps and all this stuff. And so there's this competition between keeping the eyes on the prize and then looking at all the numbers. Right. So what is the what is the fighter pilot developed? Well, the, the engineers have developed the so-called heads up display so that now you're keeping your eyes mm. looking forward, but there are some key numbers that are on your visor screen that are in your field of view as you're looking forward, you know, fuel, fuel availability and altitude and so forth. Yep. Key numbers, not all the numbers, but the two or three that really matter the most. Right. Well, that's kind of what we want in our training process and our monitoring process, too, is, is a, a bit of a heads up display. Good grief. There are a thousand numbers you can generate from training, you know, and we know that the various <laughs> yeah. training programs have been pretty good at creating metrics. Right. And, and those metrics can start steering our lives as athletes. And that's 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 the unfortunate side of technology, I would say. So what we want to really think about is simplifying, not increasing the number of variables, yeah. but simplifying the number of variables, not down to one, but down to two or three you know, that, that are that represent our heads up display for the training process and how we feel and how our body's responding. And everybody's different in the sense that, you know, there are, there will be athletes that are more feeling based. They've got a really sensitive perceptual meter in their head mm. and it's tuned in. Such and then we've got point. other athletes mm. that are going to be more, they can really, man, they can look at that heart rate data and heart rate versus power. And it tells them what they need to know. So, so, so let's, yep, let's be yep. fair that individual, there needs to be an individualization of that heads up display. 
That's a really great point. Um, and I, I know that with us between dad and I, I think dad is very in tune with uh, his perception and I really am not. If, I, if my data goes away, I kind of am guessing how I'm feeling and, and sometimes I, I feel like I'm a bit weak in myself and I, I need the data to tell me, oh, I can push harder here. Which well, is and that's probably a, cool a bit example. of a generational yeah. issue. You know, your dad was probably training before mm. – uh, all the all the technology That's all the exactly technology right. came yeah. of age <laughs> so I, I suspect there's a bit of a generational issue there uh, I'm kind of both you know yeah. I, I grew up on feeling but I kind of like the power numbers nowadays so I you know I, tend to, <laughs> yeah. I do a bit of both <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh, given you've given us so much time here, I think we'll end it there and we'll have to get you back on because we did discuss with you some topics before this that we wanted to get into and uh, we'll have to get to them another time. But um, Stephen, thank you so much for all the info you've given today. Uh, I could just listen to you, give these answers all day uh, and I have listened to many hours of you so it's, it's great to sit in front of you and talk to you. Um, My son, he cannot stand to listen to me very often. So, so there are very, very, there's varying opinions on that. <laughs> but, but I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. You That's asked some great. great questions. One final question I did want to ask is, this is a bit of a personal one, um, but uh, I know that you uh, did get to train the famous six-time NBA champion, Scotty Pippen, before he won six titles in the NBA. And if you, if you don't know who he is, uh, he's a Chicago Bulls player. He's Michael Jordan's right-hand man. Uh, do you remember, you were personal training him, do you remember what kind of training you were giving him back in late Yeah, oh, absolutely. Now you opened up a can of worms here. But, but I – before I was an <laughs> endurance person, I was all about speed and power. I, I went to the Soviet Union as a student to study their strength training methods. And that year, that same year, I, I believe that was the year I was also uh, the, the I worked at a fitness center. The owner of the fitness center had been a basketball player. So he was he knew the local coach and and he so he's the one that pulled Scottie Pippen in in that year before he became a Chicago bull or this, the summer before he had been, he'd have been a, a lottery pick as they call it. And he was dirt poor. That kid was dirt poor. And so they, you know, mm -hmm. were basically trying to protect him from himself and they had rules about how much money he could spend without a co-signer of his, of his checks, you know, and all this stuff. And they also said, well, we got to get this guy stronger. Yeah. yeah. So we were doing we were doing basic stuff, squats, power cleans, push presses, you know, just trying to build some beef and, and, and at the same time use some power type movements. So I was trying to teach him how to do what we call power cleans, if you know what I'm talking about, the, you know, the, the and and uh, and he let yeah, me tell you, yeah, man, yeah, that's yeah. a powerful athlete, but he's not Power a powerful head, yeah. weightlifter, you know, because when you're that long and you've got these tremendous long limbs, <laughs> the, these kinds of yeah. the squat, the power clean, they're not in your that you're not in your backyard on that stuff. But he got better. And, and it was all about just, you know, using helping him. Uh, use his natural athletic ability, but build up hip power and so forth. So I was his strength coach basically at the time. And, and I, at the time I was very involved. Yeah, my yeah, my first yeah. research paper that was published was on anaerobic power in American football players. So I kind of do have a background on that strength and power side. And that's, that's where Scotty Pippen came in. Not, I, it wasn't endurance. We, he, I can assure you, he did no That's endurance great... training with me uh, yeah. back then. <laughs> oh yeah, you I would mean, have loved you know, it. Was amazing. It was a great story, surely. And uh, you know, and it just shows also yeah. one of yeah. the things about uh, talent development. It, it, he's an extreme example of the fact that you need to be careful. Mm we need to be careful when we start deciding who, a, who the talents are and picking them out too early in, in life, too young, you know, the extremes that we're starting to pick age group teams and they're eight years old and we're deciding who the talents are before they hit puberty. That's mm -hmm. just silly. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, mm -hmm. you know, it, with the exception of maybe gymnastics, mm -hmm. uh, they would argue probably they already know by 10 or 11 who the mm -hmm. stars will be, you don't know, uh, you know, who the stars will be in, in track and field yep. and, and, and basketball and so forth when they're 10 years old, 11, you know, so, and that's one of the aspects. And, and that's one of the nice things about yep. 
uh, you might say the endurance process is it is a long process and it takes time, you know, and, and, and the, there is a talent mm. component. Yes. Yep. But one of the talents is persistence and, and patience and, and perseverance mm. towards the goal. That's a talent also. And in the case of Scotty Pippen, you know, he had that talent yeah. and he grew, he grew late. He grew, at age 18, he was six, three at age <laughs> 20, he was six, eight, you know, or, you know, so he grew in a way that made him go <laughs> from good to great, you know, or helped him go from good to great, but it happened late. It happened much later mm -hmm. than it should have. So he, it's one of those rare stories, but it helps yeah. to understand, helps us to remember that the, the talent development process is not the same for everyone. That's a great way to finish. Any last words from you, Dad? No, I just love that, that the actual, the key point you just made there about, uh, you know, for everybody out there listening, you, you just can't have quick fixes as an endurance athlete. It, it takes so much time to get your body to adapt to the stress and strain, uh, and particularly the event that you choose. You, you just can't have a quick fix it. I'm forever telling our athletes, this could take years for you to achieve your personal best in, in reaching your, your, and I say there's no ceiling to anything, but, but, you know, I love what you just said there about, you know, this is something about perse perseverance, persistence, consistency, and giving yourself the appropriate time to let your body get to the goal where, where, you know, for someone to come to our group and say they've got 18 weeks or 12 weeks to an Ironman, it's kind of madness to us. It, it, it is, what are you trying to achieve here? You know, yes, you could finish the event, but is that, was that why you're asking for a coach? And, and, you know, and I'm sure we could delve into this as well, but, but I don't want to go any further, but I really love that how you finished there was that, that is one of the key things. And we've talked about many key things today. And, um, this would be something that people should really grasp a lot of is you just need to keep working and things will turn your way eventually. So thank you so much for the time you've given us and for that uh, those words of wisdom throughout the whole uh, discussion. So we're really grateful, Stephen. Thank you. Listen to elite, elite athletes and they get interviewed and they you ask, you know, what was the key to your success? You never hear them say, well, it was that epic workout I did, you know, 14 days ago. But what they always say is, you know, I stayed <laughs> healthy. I didn't have any injuries and I had a really nice period of, of training where I just everything flowed. And, and that's that's what they will bring up not epic workouts or epic four week periods of, of hell in their training or anything like that. So maybe that's a lesson for us. Perfect way to finish again. Thank you so much. And thank you to the listeners for joining in and tuning in as always. And we'll see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.